Thank you so much for offering to do this. It's, um, it's a real pleasure and, and I've, I've really loved your lectures and I assume all these guys who've listened to you like uh, have done as well and I've uh, invited some more people to come and, come and listen to you. But yeah, th thank you so much. My pleasure. Glad to be here. So last week um, we listened to your introduction to Awakening from the Meaning Crisis. Um, and I was wondering if you could just, for the people that weren't here, just explain what um, the, the meaning crisis is as you see it. Sure. I mean, that's a, <laughs> that, that's a, there's a long answer to that question. Um, uh, but I'll, I'll try, um, I'll try and be as brief as I can. There's two different dimensions to it, which are covered in uh, the series. One dimension is to take a look at a basic sort of framework coming out of 4E Cognitive Science, which is this idea that uh, the interactional and intra-embodied dynamics that make us adaptively intelligent also make us perpetually susceptible to self-deceptive, self-destructive behavior. Um, and that what you see across cultures and history are ecologies of practices, designed to ameliorate that self-deception and to enhance the opposite, which is when this adaptive intelligence is fitting us to the environment, we get a sense of connectedness to ourselves, to each other and to the world, which people experience as meaning in life, which is tremendously powerful. It's non-reducible to morality or to simple mastery over the environment. It's its own dimension of uh, that contributes to human eudaimonia. And so this amelioration of self-deceptive, self-destructive behavior, this enhancement of connectedness, I use the root word uh, religio uh, to tap into the fact that it often has had religious aspects to it, um, has been, as I said, developed uh, across cultures and history uh, along the lines of wisdom. This is a way of referring to what that is. Um, and it's distinct, often distinguished from sort of theoretical knowledge. And there are powerful ways in which people can find information in the West, whatever that's supposed to point to, sort of post-Christian, post-European civilization or something. And of course, people have that, the internet, their phones, they carry around their little oracles and uh, all day long. Um, and people... Although there's more questioning about this, they're still pretty confident about where to go for knowledge, uh, which is, you know, science, uh, history, the universities, etc. But when I ask my students where they go for wisdom, they don't have an answer. There's a wisdom famine, precisely when they are assailed with more and more information, a lot of it polluted, a lot of it bullshit, a lot of it malicious. So they need to enhance their capacities for zeroing in on relevant information, connecting to it appropriately, insightfully, and that's what wisdom is. So precisely when they need more wisdom, they're more at a loss of how and where to find it and cultivate it. And then you see this showing up symptomatically in our society because we have basically bereft people of a place and a worldview that legitimates an ecology of practices for the cultivation of wisdom, whereby they can, as I said, ameliorate foolishness, enhance meaning in life. As it shows up symptomatically, you have the increases in suicide and Tatiana Schnell's work that this, a lot of these suicides are not vectored through clinical depression, but directly from a sense of meaninglessness. You have the loneliness epidemic. There was this survey done in you know, the UK in uh, 2019, 89% of people feel their lives are meaningless, even though we have all of this research showing how important meaning is to the quality of your life, your mental health, um, your sociality, uh, uh, so many other factors. So you have the loneliness epidemic, you have the addiction epidemic, and the work of Mark Lewis and others are showing that the disease model of addiction should be given up in favor of an existential learning model. 
addiction has much more it's much more like foolishness than it's like a disease you have the rise of all kinds of pseudo-religious ideologies cynicism and nihilism uh you have an incapacity for people to connect to those co those cognitive processes the non-propositional cognitive processes that are largely responsible for wisdom um you see of course positive responses there's the rise of mindfulness although i'm critical of what's become make mindfulness you see the rise of ancient philosophies specifically specializing in the cultivation of wisdom like stoicism the attempts to import problematically i think buddhism and taoism um but you also see the increased study of wisdom i participated in the wisdom consensus paper that was published in 2019 most of the world scientists studying it we got together and formulated a consensus about, uh, about all of the research that has been done and there's significant amount and it's growing all the research on meaning in life which is now a growth industry um so you see positive and negative symptoms and what i can say is that i'm also doing a lot of participant observation of many uh, emerging communities <clears throat> where people are putting together ecologies of practices and this is directly what they're trying to address they're trying to reduce self-deceptive self-destructive behavior enhance connectedness both individual and collective um, many of them do not see the existing <coughs> legacy religions as relevant to this project these are the famous nuns n-o-n-e-s's uh, the one of the fastest growing and largest demographic groups around the world um, that describe themselves in this very popular and almost useless phrase spiritual but not religious um, as a way of articulating that they are looking for something by which they can cultivate wisdom and meaning that was ineptly inadequate but that's the best i can do to hopefully get us started it's brilliant i'm um, just just on that please could you describe um the ecology of practices that people are, are using and uh, as well i'd invite anyone to please ask questions that you have as well on zoom if you could type them in the chat um, yeah so first of all the idea of an <coughs> ecology of practices is there's no such thing as a panacea practice that adaptive cognition works at many levels with opponent processing. Now uh, you can feel it in your attention right now. You have the default mode network that is making you wander away, and that adds variation to what is salient to you. And then you have the task focus network that is selecting out of it. And right, and that what you're doing is basically you're implementing uh, something very analogous to biological evolution. There's variation and selection, variation and selection most of the variations introduced by the mind wandering get killed off but some of them get drawn in and you have an insight or a new idea um and so there, there's opponent processing it's all it, that's one example of many i can give you and i can point you to talks where um uh, um I, I lay out some more of these if you understand that you understand that there is no one panacea practice because what you need are multiple practices addressing these opponent processing and getting an optimization going on so given that there's no panacea practice what you see is people trying to come up with various practices that stand in this opponent processing relationship this self-correcting self-affording uh, uh relationship and so for example i just did uh return to the source in july <laughs> very very challenging um it, it has a combination of uh, movement practices and nature connection practices for example you're doing parkour um in, in in the wild which is which was at times uh quite scary um you're doing martial arts you're doing mindfulness practices you're doing enactment practices uh they sound a little bit sound odd but you do something like you you get into a game and you pretend you're one kind of bird and uh, and other people are other kind of birds and then you sort of try and inhabit that and then you look around and try and find those birds and how they're living in their environment um it's it's an interesting way uh way of accessing perspectival knowing um then there was i taught some tai chi chuan there as well 
We did a couple of other practices, a contemplative, a meditative practice, a contemplative practice, a dialogical practices. And so all of these are pushing and pulling and correcting each other. And you get a very, very powerful transformative experience, uh, actually a sequence of them. And one of the things I, I, and I was there, I was participating in it, but I was also being an observant, being a participant observer. I also did a, a, some pilot studies. I interviewed some of the people. And one thing that was really interesting <clears throat> um, was at the end of this, I won't give away the secret sauce. There's a very powerful, challenging thing they do. Um, and it's very clearly um, demanding on, on all of these dimensions of cognition and aspiration. Um, but it's also very ritualistic. Uh, there's a ritual where people are singing and drumming and there's language of, of, of you know, sort of baptism and rebirth. And all of these people are, 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 are secular. They're not coming from a religious background. And when, when they were all done and they were like, I was talking to some of them, I said, you're all very secular, you're, but this was very much like a religious act. And then they said, yeah, they did. That's the, 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 and this is something I've noted too. Uh, as I've been trying to understand this prominent but nebulous phrase, spiritual but not religious, they were looking for something not, they were looking for something beyond exercise. They were looking for something beyond just a thrill. They were looking for something that many of them talked to me later would permeate into the re their life and percolate through their psyche. Um, and so that's what an ecology, I can give you many other examples, but that's one I just did uh, recently. Do you guys have any questions that you'd like to? I, I can you move on there? Or where is it? Okay. Just this, that, oh, that. Um, um, basic question, sorry, but what you were saying about the meaning crisis, does wisdom and gaining wisdom lead to meaning in your life? Is that is that what you were saying? How, how are those two connected, wisdom and meaning in your life? Yeah, I mean, so the idea is there are important ways in which meaning in life is driven. So I'm not claiming that wisdom is exclusively the driver of meaning in life, but what wisdom does do is generally has a set of practices. When you when you when you get into self deceptive, self destructive behavior, you tend to se sever the three, one or all of these three dimensions that are coming out in the meaning in life literature. You want to be you want people want to feel very connected to themselves. They don't want to feel alienated from their own minds and bodies. They want to feel very connected to other people, and they want to feel very connected to what's real or or the way they put it bigger than them, or that has a value independent of their egocentric valuing. This is why people have children, for example, because there's no other good explanation for why people have children. I mean, like have a child, man. You're like you, you're, you're hungry all the time. You're wet. You're, 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 you're lacking sleep. Your finances are in ruins. Your relationship with your significant under is under tatters. Uh, all the measures of subjective well-being um, go down. And when you ask people why they do it, they, they, they reliably say because it makes their lives more meaningful. So th there's an example, by the way. Having a child is a way of really increasing your meaning in life if you undertake to be a good parent, uh, and, which is an important proviso. But what I'm claiming is, is that wisdom can help ameliorate those self-deceptive, self-destructive patterns that alienate us from ourselves. Um, from other people, from the world, give us feelings of absurdity, alienation, existential anxiety, um, etc. And that the wisdom practices also can help enhance those connectedness. So, for example, I do Tai Chi Chuan, I, and what that really enhances because I get into the flow state, the connections between mind and body, and between embodied mind, body, and the world, and that. Um, and that, for example, getting more frequently into the flow state is predictive of how people value their lives. So the more often and more frequently you get into the flow state, um, that's predictive of how meaningful you find your life, how good you find your life. We did work in my lab. Uh, <clears throat> the, more the more often you've had a mystical experience is predictive of uh, how meaningful you find your life. A lot of the things that people think correlate strongly with meaning in life don't. Wealth is only initially co correlated with meaning in life, and then it has very little correlation. Um, sort of the possession of intellectual knowledge, again, um, initially important, but if it doesn't lead to transformation, 
not that highly correlated uh, with meaning in life. Um, and it, you, you probably know a lot of this that, you know, um, it doesn't even, uh, so this is part of the propositional tyranny. Um, there's no strong correlation from, from between the people who teach uh, philosophical ethics and, the, um, and moral behavior, uh, no strong correlation at all. Um, and so we're, we, we're, we're having, we're just sort of slowly zeroing in on what are the kinds of things that do enhance meaning in life and, and ameliorate foolishness. And yeah, and so that's what I'm claiming about wisdom. I'm not claiming that it's either necessary. I think I would claim it's sufficient, but I don't think it's necessary for meaning in life, but I think it's necessary for enhancing meaning in life, especially the way it's under threat in our world right now. Sorry, that was a long answer, but that was an important question. Thank you, great answer. Just on, on what, something you said there um, about the flow state, I was wondering yeah. if I um, just ask you about the relationship between, because most of us here are, are performers, um, between the flow state and something like performance anxiety. Um, do you think it's, it's something that can help musicians in particular with, with solving performance anxieties, entering into the flow state? Of course, uh, flow is anti-anxiety, anti-depression. Um, and, and by the way, anxiety and depression are interwoven with each other. They're not like opposites, right? So if you have an anxiety disorder, you're liable, very liable to have a depressive di disorder and vice versa. Uh, and flow is the anti-anxiety, anti-depression uh, channel of being. Um, and, and it's very interesting what's going on in the flow state. If you want me, I can talk more about it, but uh, I, I can, can definitely... Uh, say that a capacity to getting more reliably into the flow state is important for overcoming performance anxiety. I suffer from social phobia, so so I brilliantly took up the job of being a teacher. Um, but getting into the flow state while I'm teaching is one of the ways in which I, well, it, it's an example of what I'm talking about, is one of the ways in which I it's a, like a prophylactic against anxiety and depressive orientations that are uh, that I'm liable to because of the social phobia, and it enhances my ability to get, get connected to myself and especially to my students. Mm. Just on that, like, it, do you have any techniques that you would recommend for getting into the flow state? Yeah, and then I want to recommend techniques for getting into the flow state, and then also things you have to pay attention about the flow state in general. Um, so. I want to make clear that this is based, nothing I can say here can be completely neutral or rep because all of these topics are very much in theoretical play right now. So this is based on work that I published in 2018 with Leo Ferrara and Arian Herrick Bennett. And so you have to be very careful about what do you mean? There's environmental conditions and then there's cognitive conditions for the flow state. Um, and the environmental conditions is a little bit of a misnomer, but it's good enough for now. What you want is you want a situation in which the demands being placed on you just, just exceed your skills. So you have to give it all you have and you have to learn, you have to do some skill stretching. And then what you need is for the, the environment as you do that to keep ahead of you. Because if you supersede the environment, if your skills overtake the demands, you will start to fall out of the flow state and start to fall into boredom. If the demands are beyond your stretch, you will start to experience anxiety. So you've got to uh, make sure that you're getting into the environment the right way. There's two important things you need to do uh, on the cognitive side to do this. One is mindfulness training. Um, and and Csikszentmihalyi points to that because mindfulness training trains the cognitive flexibility that powers the flow state. You want to make sure that when you're in the flow state, the information, you're getting clear feedback of information that your actions and the environmental responses are tightly coupled and error matters, error matters. Um, so in order to deal with that, you need to get into, a, there's, there's two different ways in which you frame your arousal. One is a telic mode, this is from Michael Apter, in which, the activity is for the sake of a goal. And that means the higher your arousal, the more you're not achieving the valuable goal and you start to experience anxiety, frustration, and then and 
right? Something more even beyond that. But in the paratelic mode, you have a totally different interpretation of your own arousal. Notice this is about that connectedness to yourself I was talking about, right? So now the goal is for the sake of the activity rather than the activity being for the sake of the goal. And now arousal means you're engaged in the intrinsically valuable activity and you experience that as excitement. Now, in order to be in the paratelic mode, you have to be in safety framing which means you have to feel that your environment allows you to engage in play, serious play, rather than the goals are in some sense necessary to your survival, because that will put you into the telic mode. So in addition then to the environmental demands, and you've got the mindfulness training and the cognitive flexibility, and you're getting that information channel flowing properly, you need to have developed something like what stoicism or buddhism gives you a way of safety framing almost any experience you get in a way of reframing it so that you find the that you're not under threat and the activity is being done for its own sake if you do all of those that will really increase the chance you get into the flow state Telling yourself to get into the flow state will be is absolutely useless. Wishing that you were in the flow state will largely keep you from the flow state. You have to do, you have to sort of try not to try. You have to set up the environmental conditions, right? You have to have trained your cognition extensively before the event. And you have to have built up a sapiential framework so that you get good at reframing experiences, cognitive reframing. You, you can learn these from CBT, which is just modern stoicism in order to get you into a safety framing. When those three things happen, you're much more reliable to get into the flow state. Fourth thing, and this is now external to it, make sure that you are training the flow state in a, in a way that you will find it, what you're learning in that flow state transferring to other areas of your life uh, and to other levels of your psyche than the ones that are prominent to you where you're engaged in the behavior because that will then tend to carry the flow state more deeply into this meaning in life and then that meaning in life framework feeds back gives you the safety framing helps you find it intrinsically interesting etc cetera, etc cetera. and then you get the flow and the meaning in the life reinforcing each other brilliant brilliant <laughs> Anyone want to come on? Yeah. yeah. Oh, um, hello, um, hello, Professor. I really love the answer there for the flow state. I'm reading. Uh, I'm audible. Sorry, I'm a bit further away. John, can you hear Abhishek? I can't quite hear him. It's there's a lot of echo coming through and garbling it. Oh, at least I'll just come, come forward. Yes, um, thank you for the answer. That was really lovely. And uh, I'm a Buddhist practitioner myself. And I found that a great deal of what you said is a really wonderfully scientific reframing of a great deal of Buddhist principles in action when we think about meditation itself. Where, for example, when we are trying to attain deeper meditative absorptions, the expectation of deep meditative absorptions by itself cancels out the possibility of it happening. Yes. In it kind of is a very similar on those lines. And uh, I think that the reframing that you did actually helps to put it in practice outside of meditation and into performances as well. So I really appreciate that. However, uh, what you said earlier really, um, um, uh, really uh, uh, piqued my curiosity. So in a sense, I feel like uh, so far what's happened is that there's a there's a uh, attempted verbal reasoning your way through meaning of life as in a certain sense uh, uh, aided by as you said flow states and all these other contemplative practices right how how does moral behavior correlate with meaning of life in general in your world in this kind of worldview because uh, in, a, in a buddhist sense i uh, uh, there's a belief that the universe is inherently moral and therefore to be in line with the law of karma that pervades the universe you just have to be a moral person but that helps you to frame your own morality and your own actions in that sense. How does not having that faith or that character still allow for moral behavior to be something that you can inherently believe in or uh, take on for yourself? Yeah, excellent question. Um, so there, there are good arguments. I think Susan Wolf's book, Meaning in Life and Why It Matters, that you can't reduce meaning in life to morality. Our culture is trying to do that um, and I think it is doomed to fail because I think the arguments and the evidence uh, 
are, are, are tellingly against the proposal that by, by being as moral as we possibly can, we will have achieved the most meaningful life we can. So first of all, that's on one pole of the answer. Um, you can't reduce meaning in life to morality. But the reverse also seems to be the case that you need, uh, they need each other. And what do I mean by that? One way, and it's not the only way, because of course there's utilitarian ethics, there's deontological ethics, but virtue ethics, which tends to connect with a lot of these wisdom traditions, uh, says that, well, what moral behavior is designed to do is to help protect and uh, provide and promote uh, personhood. Um, and then what happens in many of these traditions is that there's a notion of something like agapic love or karuna, compassion in the Buddhist framework, or uh, being like the mother within Taoism, in which you recognize that there's a co that connectedness to other people can become best expressed, both best instantiated, I'm struggling a little here with the terms, for this kind of agapic love. And then what you get is that converges with a notion coming out of reason. You see this, for example, in Plato, but you see it also in Spinoza, that reason requires us transcending our egocentrism, and yet reason by the manip by inferential manipulation can't do this on its own, uh, you, because inference is propositionally driven. You need something that has that is perspectively driven, and then you get. Uh, love. You get what uh, Iris Murdoch said. Love is the painful recognition that something other than yourself is real, um, which I think is a really powerful way of putting it. And so what happens is many of these traditions, and I, I, would, I would be in agreement with them, argue that as we pursue the connectedness to others, we realize that the deepest connectedness is not how things are relevant or important to me, and listen to the word important, importing into me, but how I am connected and relevant to others. And the most important way I, in which I can be connected to them, and remember what I said about having a child, is agapic love, is connected to their project of becoming meaning makers. Mm -hmm. So, and that, that, that I think is a fundamental way in which you can ground a, 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 a sort of virtue ethic um which is if you take love to be an existential stance and not just an emotion or feeling which i take it to be in which you are prioritizing the production promotion protection of personhood people within communities of persons then i think a virtue ethic comes out and then what you see is each virtue is just a way of being wise in a particular social situation like what kindness kindness is how i'm wise in this social so situation courage is how i'm wise in this situation etc and so i think that's how the two uh come together mm. yeah that's quite an incredible answer thank you and I'm, i just wanted to express uh, some appreciation for what you just said because it is it is quite the most Mo uh, appropriate re uh, reframing of something like the meta meditation in essence as you said right now yes. you said you said you said something to the tune of, of uh, it's not enough for love to be an emotional feeling but to be an existential kind of a position or yeah, and, so in, and in meta you're trying to not just have love for other beings but be a being that's just full of loving kindness and you act from that point of view rather than just have it occasionally in your life so i feel yeah that that was actually very well put thank you so much for that yeah yeah i, I mean i think one of the great the, the, there's many trivializations bullshitting going on in our culture one of them is to reduce love to an emotion it's not an emotion I mean, you just, I mean, the work that, you know, even run, work of Ronda D'Souza and others at UFT, right? Like, yeah, when I'm, when I, when I love somebody that can, that can cause me to be angry if they're threatened, it can make me jealous, right? It can, it, it can make me sad if they're, if they're gone or fall into grief if I lose them. Like love isn't an emotion and even less emotions aren't feelings, but we've reduced love to a feeling. And then we, by doing that, we've lost the deep connectedness that is possible uh, through understanding the deep, the deep interrelationships between the cultivation of wisdom and the cultivation of love um, as a virtue. 
as an existential stance that is coupling you appropriately to yourself and other people and the world. Very briefly on that, sorry, there are some questions on the Zoom, but you mentioned, and I completely agree, that love is not an emotion, but when you gave examples of that, you listed a load of emotions like anger and jealousy. Is that really what you mean? Is that really what I mean? Oh, that sorry, love do you see what, sorry, I, there's only a question of, I don't think I quite understand you saying love isn't an emotion by then saying that love might cause you to then feel a bunch of emotions. That's so, right. So, so love is something that affords particular emotions, some that, that can be almost directly contrary to each other. So the, there isn't, you know, there isn't sort of a shared emotion through all those emotions. There's a way in which one relates to the world and is oriented to the world that affords those kinds of emotions coming into existence and then shaping what you find relevant and salient in a in particular context. That's what emotions are, right? They're rapid ways of orienting your salience landscaping, what you find relevant and important and and and, and what identities or roles you're assigning sorry, assuming and what you're assigning. I mean, so when I'm angry, right, I'm uh, that certain things are standing out to me, salient, a lot of things are backgrounded. I'm assuming a particular identity. I'm assigning identities. It's, a, it's an entire affordance for an agent arena uh, relationship. So actions become readily available and affordable to me. That's what an emotion is. And then love is um, kind of the meta affordance. It's the overall stance that makes particular kinds of, right, emotions available to you and affordable to you. So yeah, I'm seeing it, 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 it like a meta emotion if if we're using sort of a, a taxonomy. Mm -hmm. Thank you. I think I think that's how we mean it. Cheers. Mm. So there's some more questions on on the Zoom chat. Um, so I'm just going to read them out. Uh, so Joel asks, "What is meaning? How do you define it?" What is meaning in and of life? Um, probably two different questions. So meaning in life, is it on an individual level? Meaning of life, could it be on, um, could it be one common thing for everyone? Like Einstein's idea of one formula that explains everything. Is each individual's meaning in life different? And should people be searching for the meaning of life if one exists? Um, so first of all, there is a deep, as you, uh, uh, Joel, as you foresaw, there's a deep distinction between meaning of life and meaning in life. And the distinction is explicitly um, developed um, in the psychology and the cognitive science of meaning of life. Uh, meaning of life is the proposal that there is some metaphysical order or plan that has something like a destiny for you. That is the meaning of life. And either individually or collectively, we are to, we are to discover it um, and then the discovery of that will reveal to us how we should live. Um, I find that proposal for many philosophical, ontological, and scientific ontological and epistemological reasons, I find that proposal close to preposterous. I don't think there's anything of merit in it. I know some people do, but um, I think the overwhelming evidence uh, for the capacity of the universe to be indifferent to us and to our narrative projects, um, and a bunch of other things. The fact that re most of reality is non-teleological, outside of living things, etc., uh, <coughs> undermine the proposal of meaning of life. Meaning in life is a psychologically measurable thing. We can measure it. We can see what modifies it. We can experience, we can experimentally induce things that will make it increase or decrease. Um, and it is that exactly it is that sense of connectedness. Um, you know what that is intuitively, um, but we largely are inept theoretically right now at explaining what that sense of connectedness is. But a lot of the work of myself and many other people in sort of 4E cognitive science, meaning in life community, right? I mean, the scientific communities, um, the wisdom, again, the academic scientific communities, but also the practitioners, right? We're trying to explicate more what this means, but you're doing it right now, right? Before you can process the propositions, what you're actually doing is you have to be correctly oriented. You have to be foregrounding and backgrounding both perceptually and conceptually the right things. 
you have to be getting that optimal grip between introducing some variation, but tracking what I'm saying, and you're trying to get that to fit. It's optimally gripped, right? Not too zoomed in, not too zoomed out, flowing with it, adapting with it, evolving with it. You have to be assuming the right identity. I assume you're not, ass I assume you're not assuming the identity of a romantic partner right now, which would probably mess you up about this talk significantly. But if I were to take this into a, a romantic situation, the identity I'm assuming right now, that would also mess things up. You know a lot of this intuitively. You have some skills around this, but these skills can, of course, be explicated and potentially explained and thereby improve the explication and enhanced. So the meaning in life is, think about that. So you can, you're connecting to yourself in the right way. You're connecting to this situation. You're connecting to the people around you. You're trying to get that optimal grip about paying attention to them, but paying attention to your inner world, paying attention to me, getting that off. And there's complicated, try to give a machine the ability to do this. You know what it's easy to give a machine the ability to do? Manipulate propositions according to logic. That's bloody easy. You know what's hard? Giving it the abilities that I just described. I know because I work in this area. And all of that has to be in play before you can turn the noises coming out of my face hole, because that's all that's really happening, into ideas of philosophical merit, hopefully, within your mind. So that semantic meaning sits on top of all of this non-propositional meaning as appropriate connectedness, optimal gripping. And of an ongoing evolution of what is relevant and salient to you how, and how that affords what roles you're taking up, what identities you're assigning. That's what I mean by meaning in life. And you and I have a huge amount of motivational machinery attached to all of that meaning in life that affords our cognitive agency. So much so that when we start to feel disconnected from other people in loneliness, or we start to feel connected to the usual arena in which all of that makes sense when we're homesick or culture shocked, then you become really aware of all of that rap, normally implicit machinery that is so important to your fundamental sense of belonging to yourself, to other people, and to the world. That's what I mean by meaning in life. Mm, just before we come on to the next question in the chat, um, you mentioned something there about optimal gripping. Um, yes. In your uh, on uh, Insight, I think it was, um, you talk about attention, like a model of attention being something like a finely tuned string instrument. Um, yes. that's, that's a metaphor, using a musical instrument as a metaphor for attention. Do you think that practicing a musical instrument um, is a metaphor for a lot of these cognitive processes? Oh. <laughs> yeah, think about it. I mean, think about, and if, you know, it's no coincidence that there's the story of the Buddha, right? He's, he's, uh, he, he's sitting under the bow tree and he's, you know, he, uh, not the Bodhi tree, that's early, that's later. He's sitting under the tree and he's starving himself to death, right? And, and, and he falls into the river and he, the little girl saves him and gives her the rice pudding. But then he hears the musician on the barge right? It's telling the, the apprentice, no, no, the lute string can't be too tight or too loose. So there's been long-standing, even archetypal connections between uh, music and the cultivation of wisdom. And, and, and think about what music is. Think about, think, about, think about how music is the serious play. We play music. Music is the serious play with your salience landscaping for its own sake, free of any propositional right? Interference. What is music about? In one sense, nothing. In another sense, it's all about enhancing that connectedness. That's why when we want to enhance connectedness, for example, in a movie, we add music. What's it doing there? It's not adding new propositions to what the people are saying. It's not adding to the visual domain. It's adding to our connectedness. That's why when we want to have really enhanced connectedness, religio, music is central. That's why for many people, the epitome of a sacred experience has music within it. 
Mm, this just so before we come into the rest of the questions in the chat, this has a lot to do with um, my own sort of sentiments um, in in um, say contemporary music, for example, or music that is avant garde, that's sort of pushing the the boundaries of what we consider music. And when this is premiered in a concert hall, people don't really get it. And it's, it takes a lot of effort to actually trying and listening to it. But I think the music that has been most uplifting for me, for example, let's say um, Mahler's second symphony or something, the, the, the finale to that when there's like a, a very obvious um, perfect cadence right at the end of it, that's so uplifting. And it's, it's something so simple that this composer is just offering to his, his audience that everyone connects with. Do you think that this sense of felt connection and perhaps like a, co a collective flow state has something to do with musical beauty or something to do with why people appreciate music? I think so. I mean, uh, I think what, one of the things that we can learn from the ancient tradition, ancient philosophy, um, is a notion of beauty as the situation in which appearances disclose depth, disclose what's more real, more, more powerful, pertinent, pressing patterns, um, rather than appearances like what we have in the hermeneutics of suspicion, that appearances are always deceptive, duplicitous, distracting, distorting. Um, I, I agree with Marlo Ponti and Plato that um, finding things to be illusory is always dependent comparatively on finding something else to be real. And so rediscovering the, the beautiful, at least in this sense, as when appearances disclose reality, when they connect us, when they're doorways into a deeper connection, um, I, I think that very much could be understood as a proposal as to like the cognitive dimension of the experience of the beautiful. The problem, of course, is, you know, the beautiful is very much um, equivocal right now. I, I think of Hans' book, Saving Beauty, where he talks about that we've reduced the beautiful to the smooth. Um, so technological functionality has become predominant because we've reduced uh, beauty to ease of use um, or ease of perception or ease of conception. Um, now you think about it, that, that's, that, that, that's so ironic because if beauty is appearances disclosing reality, then there's a sense in which that overlaps with this proposal of easy access, but the easy access can actually distort us. So it, there's, a, there's, a, there's a sort of pregnant uh, philosophical irony there to be explored. Back to your question, I do think that uh, getting people into a collective flow state where they gain access, what, what do we, let me show you more, more concretely. When we're in the collective flow state, we know what's going on in other people's minds like much more powerfully, not not perfectly, but much more powerfully than, than we do in most situations. And we find that really, we're all in it, and, you know, people are keeping the beat. E even if you get people just to move in synchrony with each other, they start to uh, feel, not inaccurately, but not perfectly, that they know what's going on in each other's minds. This is very powerful. Um, a lot of the dialogical practices get people into a collective flow state and people use musical metaphors often to try and explain uh, uh, how how that phenomenology is unfolding for them. So, uh, yeah, I mean, John Rusin in his book, Bearing Witness to Epiphany, he, he tries to unpack the phenomenology of sense making and he uses musical metaphors. He uses rhythm and melody and harmony to try and explain the phenomenology of intelligibility itself. So I, I, yeah, I, the, I mean, that's a long answer, but I think there's deep overlaps between the musicality of intelligibility, individual and collective flow states, enhanced meaning making, and the hermeneutics of beauty. I think they all interpenetrate each other. Brilliant. So um, just, I think uh, G answers um, question has been answered already. Um, Charles asks, has there been any work looking at superficiality in modern life? The yeah. volume and availability of knowledge making us less likely to spend the time needed to go more deeply into fewer things. I suppose this is a question of attention. Uh, butterfly skipping from plant to plant or bees going deep into a flower or something. <laughs> Yeah, uh, I mean, this is why I think Iris Murdoch's The Sovereignty of the Good is such an important book, uh, because she makes the argument exactly that the pivot point of 
the good uh, 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 of a life oriented towards the good, both all goods, epistemic goods, ontological uh, epistemic goods, um, ontological goods, and uh, moral goods. Uh, the crux of the matter is the proper education of attention, because attention is exactly the pivot point between perception and cognition, the organism, the environment, the individual individual cognition, collective intelligence of distributed cognition. It's the pivot point. It's 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 actually sort of intelligence. Uh, sorry, it's it's attention, fluid intelligence, consciousness, and working memory. They're, they're really these core four, four different aspects of the same thing. But if we extend attention to mean all of that, then I think it's it's act, uh, absolutely the pivot point uh, for meaning in for meaning in life. And I, I think I, I think Charles is right. Um, we have. I, I keep using this term, so I want to I want to make it more technical. So um, Harry Frankfurt in On Bullshit distinguishes bullshit from lying. The the liar depends on your commitment to the truth to change your behavior. They commit they get you to believe something is true that is not in order to change your behavior. The bullshit artist doesn't do that. The bullshit artist makes you indifferent to the indifferent to the pursuit of truth, and instead relies on the fact that you can get caught up in how salient things are to you, how catchy they are to you. And that's what bullshitting does. Bullshitting basically makes you not, it, it sort of shuts off the questioning um, activity and gets you caught up in the salience of things. This is how advertising works. You watch and, you know, you, you, you know, we all know the advertisements are false, Right. Uh, you know, you, you, here's a bunch of people at a bar and they're drinking and look at how gorgeous they are, and how healthy and happy they are. And look at them. And there, there's obvious immediate sexual attraction going on, but it's beautiful. And go into a bar. It's not like that at all. <laughs> <laughs> you all know that. But what does that do? when you're watching the commercial, the commercial puts you into this fictional place where you don't question, you don't. You don't pursue the truth. You just get caught up in the salience. And you say, well, that doesn't matter. Yes, it does. That's why you buy the bloody product. That's why the advertisers pay billions to do this. Bullshitting works. And the problem we have, especially with social media, it is, it is like the meth of bullshitting. It is putting all of that machinery on like and it, like just accelerating it and so we are more and more caught up with the intensity of salience at the expense of pursuing the legitimacy of the claims being made so our culture is we're awash in it we, we in the book that i wrote with uh uh christopher master and philip misovic about zombies because i think zombies are a, 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 a recent myth for trying to explain no to exemplify the meaning crisis we tracked the increase in people's talking about and recognition of bullshit, and it's spiking, like it's going up exponentially. People really feel that they are awash in an increasing tsunami of bullshit. And in that sense, our culture is being just dragged into very dangerous superficiality. So that's my answer to your question, Charles. Thank you. Very helpful. Thank you. Dr. Viveki, how you doing today? I'm good. You can call me John. Oh, John, it's nice to meet you. Um, so, so, so me and, and the rest of these uh, young people here, um, some of us, I, from what the government has told us, we are young. I'm kidding. I'm kidding. I don't. But I'm not a conspiracy theorist. I don't believe that they turned the frogs gay. Um, the water is turning the frogs gay. Um, but uh, so we have. Uh, so from my introduction, um, from your introduction, I do agree with you in the sense that, like, because towards the end of your introduction, you had said not the nine dot problem and feeling as if like solving the meaning crisis could possibly going off to the verge. But there are a couple things within your um, talks that I do have particular curiosities about that I would love if you could expound on. Um, you had mentioned and, you know, uh, you had 
of course, like reiterated uh, and, and talked about like psycho um, technology. You also may mention of uh, particular things and, and the awareness of how our minds function um, when we like the whole idea with, you know, um, and a thought turns into a physical thing and how we uh, make things out of those particular things. Um, and, and those things are great. But I, I'm curious to know what is your thought process and how, um, because you talked about the recent statistics, is there a possibility that it's not so much that the issues that we have in the day to day that we're not aware of how we use things and its function, but rather our day-to-day -day lives in certain circumstances that have happened. Could it possibly, could it possibly, possibly be that, um, you know, like, um, you know, people gain certain things and then they're not satisfied. Could capitalism be a factor? Could race and, and how the mythology and race and, and, and our economic, uh, uses of different things, could they be factors? Could, um, and, and how would you, I guess, connect shamanism in all of this kind of particular, yeah, because I've, I've was attentive in that. <laughs> um, but how would shamanism play in solving the world's issues if a lot of people, you know, because life is a game of chance, that's just what I believe, um, in, in helping to solve these day-to-day -day lives and learning to heal because you have a lot of TikTokers and influencers, of course, you know, being so-called therapists, you know, without any necessarily training. And you see like the daily journal prompts and them encouraging one another and come on guys, we can do it. And we're healing and blah, da, 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 but we're still looking for that meaning. Um, what I just want to hear your thoughts on all of these things. <laughs> Uh, uh, there were many threads. I see. Uh, I'll see if I can weave them into an answer. Okay. Uh, uh, the first, uh, is I do think, it, I'm not quite sure if I got it right, but there is something about uh, a deep interpenetration of these of your worldview and um, your day to day life. Let me give you a primary example of a psychotechnology, uh, right? Um, or at least a symbolic machine, maybe I'll put it that way. Home. Mm -hmm. Now, your home is not your dwelling. I mean, because you, you can have dwellings that aren't your home. I travel a lot. I stay in hotels, right? Mm -hmm. I go, go and visit. Those aren't my home. And what's a home? Well, a home is a, a, a dwelling that you do all this symbolic stuff about in order to try and enact your particular worldview like you put pictures on your walls and you get certain styles of furniture and you play certain kinds of music all to make it your home when you're doing all this symbolic behavior it, 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 it in terms of your economic existence it's all useless other than giving you um, reason to buy products i'll come back to capitalism in a sec because that was another one of your themes yes. right now one way in which domicile, sorry, sorry, one way in which the meaning crisis affects people in the day-to-day -day life is people have an increasing sense of domicile. This is the work done by Brian Walsh, Portia Smith, which is they have dwellings, but they don't feel at home. Okay. And that's spreading. And something made that really, really acute, which was COVID, in which people were trapped in their dwellings and lost the sense of the dwellings being home because the homes lost the connection to the wider world. And that's why we have a, you know, a mental health tsunami coming out of uh, COVID. And by the way, as a scientist, I just want to say this, I'm not happy that this was true, but I'm happy as a scientist. I predicted just as COVID was hitting that you would see a massive uptick in mental health issues, conspirituality, conspiracy theory, uh, spirituality being born, all kinds of crap like that. And it, it did come to pass. This is what I mean about there isn't, there isn't the, the, the big picture and the, the minutia of our daily lives are massively interpenetrating with each other. Now, what about the thing you said? Um, 
issues like capitalism. I think one of the things that capitalism does is exacerbate the meaning crisis by creating what Fromm calls modal confusion. So we, from, remember I said about love is an existential mode. There are many existential modes we have. One is what Fromm calls the having mode. And this is the mode in which these, these this is a surrounding needs that are met by having something. You have to have water. You have to have air. You have to control it and be, it has to be consumable by you or you're dead. And so you have, you have, you build up a manipulative, consumptive, controlling intelligence in order to meet those having needs. And there's nothing immoral about that. In fact, it's immoral to prevent people from being able to satisfy their having needs. But you also have needs that are not met by having something. You have needs that are met by becoming someone. You need to become more mature. You need to become more loving. You need to become wiser. And those are not met by controlling and consuming. They're met by binding yourself, enhancing that connectedness, that religio. And they don't terminate the way you're having mo needs can. Like there's a, you, there's, you can say to yourself, I have enough water for now, right? You don't really ever say, well, I'm, I'm as mature as I need to be. Because that's usually a really good sign that you're immature, by the way. <laughs> so what can happen is neither one of these no modes, modes is good or evil. That's that's one of the big mistakes. This goes back to the Stoics, where Fromm gets it from. The mistake is when we confuse them. We get modally confused. What does that look like? And this will come to capitalism in a sec, so hang on. When we pursue being needs within the having mode. I need to be mature, so I'll have a car. I need to be in love, so I'll have more sex. And this is where capitalism can exacerbate moral confusion through bullshitting us by trying to keep us within the having mode while triggering our being needs. Think about how often so many things are sold to you because of your identity, which is this term we're all arguing about. And we should stop and slow down and pay attention to the fact that it is also the source, this discourse is the source of a lot of manipulation that is being exercised upon us. Because when you keep people, when you, if you tell people, for example, that an identity is something they have and that they can, then it's like a product that they acquire and that, right? And, the, and that what you do, if you have these clothes and if you have these propositions and it, right? You can just exacerbate modal confusion and you can sell people more and more ideas, products. You can manipulate your, their behavior. This was Fromm's critique. And he was making this critique in the 70s, by the way. Think about how it's exacerbated now. So do things, can things like capitalism exacerbate the meaning crisis? Yes, through modal confusion. And again, Modal confusion is an example of how an overarching big picture worldview thing can impregnate the minutia of your day-to-day -day life. Think about the clothes you choose to wear. So I think that was two of your three themes. The big one you dropped at the end was shamanism. <laughs> I <laughs> think shaman, I, and, and I, 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 you know, I talk about it in episodes one and two of Awakening from the Meaning Crisis. I, I support the hypothesis, it's not mine alone, but it's not also total consensus, that the thing that drove the upper Paleolithic transition is when human beings seem to take this great leap forward in, in, you know, in the technologies they're using, they invent music, art, um, calendrics, um, significant ritual. What drove that was something like shamanism, the, uh, probably the world's oldest uh, you know, ecology of practices. And so shamanism give us this ability to directly alter our state of consciousness, engage in metaphorical bridging between different kinds of, uh, uh, of category. We, we now take, we take metaphoric thought utterly for granted. But think about how much it pervades your thinking. By the way, saying that it pervades your thinking is a metaphor. But I hope you see what I'm saying. I hope you get my point. Can you grasp it? You understand it? 
that is so woven now with our cognition that it's almost transparent to us. But shamanism gave us that enhancement. We can manipulate consciousness. We can enter into metaphorical thought. We can take the alteration of consciousness and metaphorical thought and put it into music and into dance. And we have evidence of music and dance. But you also get projectile weapons like the atlatl and then the bow and arrow. And you get calendrics, the ability to uh, understand time. You get all of this emerging. And shamanism was driving that. It's, so there's deep connections between the kind of cognition we have and religio, a sense of enhancing the connectedness that I've been talking about here. So shamanism is central. Do I think anybody can be a shaman today? No. Which is going to piss pe people off. Because you can't take, you can't take an ecology of practices out of the environment to which it is adapted and just use it as if it's a, it, it, as if it's a commodity. This is one of the problems we're having with mindfulness. So I, I practice mindfulness. I teach it. I scientifically study it. I think it was the first person at U of T to do this. But I also criticize the way we are doing that with mindfulness. We have what has been called mic mindfulness. We have reduced this very complex ecology of practices to meditation that is designed to calm you and make you accept your life as a corporate drone. That's not mindfulness, right? You can't just take things out of the environmental situation in which they evolved and emerged and hope that they will then continue to operate as they always have. Shamanism evolves in and belongs with a hunter-gatherer way of life. And I think if you, not, if you are not living a hunter-gatherer way of life, you are creating mixed shamanism, just like we are creating mixed mindfulness. And I think that carries with it a significant amount of danger. Now, I think we should do our best to learn from the shamanic traditions, just as I think we should do our best to learn from the Buddhist traditions. But... I think we should be very, very, and I'm not saying this is impossible because cultures do lead into each other, but we have to be really, really careful because what we're actually going to create is something that is, right, a combination of whatever it is we're claiming and the Western framework. Buddhism, to just use an example, Buddhism that is emerging here will not be the Buddhism that was in Asia. It can't be. Just like Buddhism leaves India and goes into China and integrates with Tao and becomes Chan and then goes to Japan and integrates with Shinto and becomes Zen. And Zen and Theravada Buddhism look similar in some ways and very different in others. You have to pay. That's how it happens. It's the same thing's happening here. You're not going to be, you shouldn't be. Sorry, I'm getting too frustrated. I'm getting too passionate. You have to learn how to exact this. Uh, I, I tell people to put on my tombstone, neither nostalgia nor utopia. You can't simply go back to shamanism. That doesn't mean we shouldn't do our best to learn profoundly from it. And how can we exact it into our current context? For example, shamanism really has no good ways of helping you deal with the modal confusion driven by corporate capitalism that is magnified by the bullshit in social media, what does shamanism have to say about that? What could it possibly have to say about that? This is the same reason why the axial religions are largely being abandoned by people, not because they're, we've shown them to be false, it's because they don't have anything to tell us about how to deal with social media, how to deal with the meta crisis right, of the, right, of the environment, of economics, of political polarization, how to deal with the emerging AI. The legacy religions have almost nothing to say to us about that. So that's a long answer, but it's really important. And as you can see, it it concerns me very deeply. We, 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 we have to, I think the best is, you know, Gadamer's notion of bridging our horizons. We have to enter into dialogical relationship with wisdom traditions, but we have to evolve something that is, emerges out of and is a response to our context that we're in. Mm -hmm. 
I have a question. Yeah. Uh, a uh, couple of questions based on uh, what you said earlier uh, in terms of the way you said it was we we have to be more wiser we have to be more connected in a certain way yes. while I was speaking about an earlier answer um, I was wondering why in uh, why in this world do you is it mandatory to be wiser or happier uh, sorry wiser or connected because to my in my in my understanding of things the the eventual outcome of being wiser and being more connected is that you just end up being more happier and and you just end up suffering less from things that would affect you much more normally if you aren't wise or if you aren't connected. So in essence, could you say that um, the mandatory nature of being wiser and the mandatory nature of trying to be more connected leads to a conclusion that meaning of life or meaning in life is to be happier in essence, because that's where it's leading on to is happiness, the meaning in life. I would love it if it was so, and I do believe it is very much so. But uh, that's kind of almost inherently assumable from that, uh, from the answer that you gave earlier. Now I'll ask the second part of my question later so that this can be answered first, but yeah, please go on. Yes, so the, 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 the problem, I, there's something really right about that answer, but there's something very problematic about that answer. The, the, the question, and I'm not trying to foist something on you, we're in dialogue. Right, uh, is that the that the term can, is is generally used in, in in a univocal manner, which is false. Happiness is one of the most equivocal terms in our culture right now. Happiness can mean uh, for some people it it literally means a kind of sensation in their body. For other people, it's an it's a feeling. For other people, it's an emotion. For other people, it's the judgment that one is leading a good life according to normative standards. Some of them are moral. Some of them are aesthetic. Some of them are ontological. For other people, it's some combination of a moral life, a meaningful life, and a life in which you have sufficient mastery over your environment that you are you have reliable cognitive agency. Um, so I don't use the term happiness precisely because it is so equivocal. If what you mean by happiness is that I am leading a life in which I have optimal, not maximal, optimal connectedness, such that I have optimal cognitive agency and optimal moral agency and vice versa, my moral agency, my cognitive, when there's a strong positive manifold between those three, this is what Bishop basically argues in his book on well-being. When you have a dynamical system between those so that the meaning in life and the moral agency and the cognitive agency are all mutually affording and correcting each other in an optimal fashion, if that's what you mean by happiness, yeah. That's what is behind all of this. Uh, I don't mean it individually, just individually. It has to be both for the individual cognition, uh, running on an individual person, and the collective intelligence running on distributed cognition. This goes to what's called the cultural hypothesis of, in of intelligence. Most of two points around this most of our problem solving is not done by us individually. Mm. look around you listen to the lang. I didn't make this language did you I didn't make any of this equipment did you I'm not running the electrical grid did you did, did you I'm not running the social media I'm not running blur, all of this look around you that's always happening we very 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 infrequently solve problems as a single individual there's increasing evidence this might provoke some of you because you're philosophers, that we reason better in groups than we do as individuals. Good experimental evidence. You put people into an individual version of, for example, the waste and selection task, and only 10% of people get it right reliably. You put them into groups of four where they can talk to each other and their success rate goes up to 80%. Reliably, more and more and more. We are working memory is weaker than that of a chimpanzee's. This has been experimentally demonstrated. What most correlates with our measures of IQ, our measures of working memory? Chimpanzee has greater working memory capacity, human being, reliably, repeatedly, robustly. Then how is it that we're more intelligent than them? Be precisely because we know how to interface our cognition with the cognition of others. Way before the internet linked computers together and released this power, the power of distributed cognition, Culture link individual brains together and release the power of distributed cognition. Most of our cognition is 
meant to be and in fact takes place in and through and with other people. You learn to correct your behavior by internalizing the perspectives that other people take on you. That's how you get your metacognition. That get, that's how you get your Cartesian ability to reflect on yourself. So when I say all of this, it doesn't mean an egocentric ethic of optimizing the positive dynamic manifold between mastery, morality, and meaning in life. It means individually and collectively optimizing that. And if you say, well, but what's all that for? I don't have any answer. And I don't know why I should, because at some point we, I think, correctly chose that human lives well lived are inherently valuable. And that's it, full stop. So mm -hmm. that's my answer. Yeah, I'm willing to uh, sacrifice my attachment to the term happiness uh, in order to maybe bless you a sense of well-being. But in essence, any term that that equates to what you describe much in much more detail, I'm willing to go. Off. But in fact, isn't it the logical continuation of practicing connectedness that leads you to the insight that the division between self and the other is really arbitrary? And wishing for well-being, in essence, also wishes for the well-being of almost everything in general, rather than my own well-being of the other's well-being in essence as well. The, the, the practice of connectedness logically or even uh, or inherently should lead on to that uh, within of itself. I, I think so. But I think I, but I, I think that's also the, the, the key uh, uh, to rationality. I mean, this goes towards Agnes Callard's wonderful work on aspiration, right? So aspiration is when you are trying to become other than you are. And of course, it's at the core, therefore, of morality. It's at the core of the attempt to gain knowledge. It's at the core of the attempt to be more rational, to be wiser. The thing is, that relationship is one that right? It, it, it's one that is not driven by sort of inferential reasoning. And so you, you have to learn how to connect to something beyond yourself. And, and let me give you an example of what I mean. I don't want to talk ab abstractly about this. Let's take something that looks like it's totally, you know, just egocentric and self-serving. See, and this is, I'm, I'm describing a series of experiments now. I'm just giving you sort of like uh, you know, a profile of many different experiments by Hirschfeld and others. You go into academics, us, we're supposed to be the best and the brightest. You give them overwhelming evidence and argument that they should start saving for the retirement right now. You let them out, raise whatever objections, you meet them, you get everybody to agree that yes, you come back in six months, how many of those people are saving from the environment, Vir saving for the retirement? Virtually none, virtually none. Now you do this. You say, I want you to imagine your future self as a member of your family that you love. An older person that you love. You want to take care of. That you're bound to by relationships of love and caring. And I want you to imagine that and really experience it. Then you come back in six months and what you find reliably are these two results. Now people are starting to save for their, for their retirement. And the more vividly they could engage in that imagination, the more they have actually saved for their retirement. That aspirational ability that is so central to our rationality can't always be captured in many important vectors of development just by inferential practices. So yes, your ability to love taking you out of an egocentric framework is something that is also central to being rational. This is what I'm trying to argue for. This is a platonic notion. The idea that love properly understood and rationality properly understood are deeply interpenetrating with each other. So I agree with you, but I, I, I'm trying to say it's not just, you know, if you do this connectedness, you'll get happy. It's also it, 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 like rationality presupposes the ability to do this kind of connectedness. So it's also deeply rational to do this. Look, one of the hallmarks of rationality is that you feel called to develop it more. If you're rational and you feel no, if you claim to be rational and you feel no compulsion to become more rational, that's a good evidence you're not a rational being. 
But when I aspire to have a rationality, an identity and a perspective taking that I don't currently have, I can't get to that by reasoning about it. I have to engage, I have to engage in aspirational projects that involve me loving. Please remember what I said, love isn't a feeling or an emotion, it's an existential stance. So the leap of love and the leap of reason are intertwined together. So I'm agreeing with you, but I'm trying to deepen it. I'm trying to make it integral to your sense of what it is, right? It's not just that you're, you, you're wise in order to be happy, right? That connectedness also affords the, the rationality that is so integral to be, becoming a wise person. I completely, okay. sorry, I completely agree with you on this notion. In fact, in my in my own personal practice, I am doing all these other things that do not involve verbal reasoning of any sort whatsoever, or rational rational reasoning of any sort whatsoever. No inferential reasoning. And there and the the William James definition of a spiritual experience that it's both noetic and ineffable. Where you can't you can't inferentially reason it, but you know something has been added to your set of awareness or to your consciousness or to your cognition. So I completely agree with you on that. My take is how do people who do not believe in or who accept the who accept uh, the notion that the universe is mostly non teleological that you know that there's nothing outside of living beings that care about living beings that there is nothing more than just life on earth by itself that is worth caring about how do people who who take up this worldview as their central notion as one of the central notions in their life how do they overcome the need to be just rational because how do they how can they hold on to uh, to these things of non-inferential reasoning when it's being tested how how do they remember if it's not through some degree of faith or some degree of 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 convincing that something else is there that they can that you know how do they remember to be connected in an in a non-inferential non-logical way when when things are being tested and I, I, within that framework i'm finding it and that's why i asked that's why i was trying to reason out things for happiness through that framework, because in, in such a framework, I don't find it how it's more easier to, uh, to stick onto that. So, yeah. So there's a lot there. Uh, first of all, uh, uh, sati, mindfulness means to remind, to remember. Uh, again, uh, reducing it to paying attention to the present moment without judgment, as John Kabat-Zinn did, seriously misrepresents what mindfulness is. Just seriously. But just, just, just a moment on that. Right? Okay. So... You, you have to get people to, to remember, to remind in the sense of sati that they have those ineffable moments of enhanced connectedness on a daily basis. When they have an insight, when they do something like, oh, oh, I thought she was angry, but she's actually afraid. I get it now. And everything, the relevance and the salience changes, and then they feel more connected to the reality of that person. Now you ask people, do you like having insights? Well, the answer is, well, yeah, of course. If I didn't have insights, I'd be like, I'd be really screwed. And they're really powerful experiences. Tell me what you're doing when you're having an insight. Explain it to me, please. Um, I don't have an insight. And then I have an insight. That's the answer. Now you can study it scientifically, and I do. I do in depth. <laughs> You are participating, and I use that word really seriously, you are participating in the very machinery that is at the height of a mystical experience. There's a cognitive continuum between what happens in insight and what happens. We found that in the experiment that I told you about. Mystic, mystical experience predicting meaning in life. It doesn't depend on the weird phenomenology, and I saw this or I saw that. Because you know what? People have varying phenomenology. It's the insight machinery that's actually the, what carries the relationship between the mystical experience and meaning in life. I argued in that paper of flow, uh, on flow that what the flow state is, it's an insight cascade. It's where an insight is priming, an insight is priming, an insight is priming, an insight. That's why you get it in jazz and poetry and rock climbing and sparring. It's an insight cascade. And there's a continuum between insight flow, mystical experience, and then transformative experience. Uh, that's a mystical experience in which people are called to change their lives and their identities because they want to be connected to the really real. That's the language they use when they have these experiences. You don't have to teach people about a particular ontology. This is where perhaps you and I are disagreeing. 
they can they right you don't uh, i don't think you need a narrative ontology an ontology that there's a story a telos to the universe because that is to confuse connectedness with purpose and one of the things people experience in these profound experiences is purposelessness the rose has no why so living without a why right and so when you connect that also to the fact that when you do research into meaning in life purpose is only one of the four dimensions and not the most important of meaning in life but our culture tells us purpose 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 but mattering actually is way more important. Coherence is way more important. Realness is way more important than purpose. And I think both that literature and the mystical traditions, right, say, I don't need the universe to have a particular telos in order for me to have enhanced connectedness with it. I mean, I think it's possible to fall in love with the depths of being the way you can fall in love with the depths of a person without that being a project on my behalf. I mean, in fact, if I used to think of my relationship to my beloved as a project with a purpose that I'm working towards, I'm going to destroy that relationship. I mean, there are certain features of connectedness I want within it, of course, but I think the ability to fall in love with being doesn't depend on a teleological metaphysics. I do, I do not think our current ontology is good for it, and that's where you and I may be, may be agreeing. But I do not think that returning to a teleological uh, metaphysics is necessary for that. If cognition is fundamentally like life, which is what I'm arguing for, and what all of 4E cognitive science argues for, think about this question. What's the final form of life? What's the purpose of life other than itself? There is nothing. That's a defining feature of life. Life has no purpose other than itself. And there is no final form of life. Evolution is not teleological, but nevertheless, it keeps going on. Um, so... You probably don't agree, but that's my attempt to give you, a, hopefully, a respectful answer. I, I completely agree with you on that. I don't think a teleological purpose might be necessary to have the insights that you've had. I just feel it's just easier to stick with them if you have a teleological sense of the universe rather than, rather than not, which is, well, especially when you're when times test here, just just having that extra help kind of just makes it easier. That's all I, that's all I, I wish to add to that, yeah. Okay. I, I, I want to address Paul's question here. What is the meaning of connectedness without purpose? I take it that purpose is something beyond your activity to what, that gives the ultimate justification for your activity. I think you do many things that are purposeless, like playing music, that are done for their own sake. Things that are done for their own sake have no purpose, but they are deeply meaningful and connected to you, in, connected for you. In fact, most of the things that you find most meaningful are the ones that have no purpose other than themselves. But saying that, that they are their own purpose is largely a, just a clumsy way of talking. They are purposeless. They are for their own sake. If I can just uh, un unmute and to answer. So um, I, I see what you're saying, but do they not? I, I'm not sure that they have no purpose. Um, listening to music, you do it without a, a you know a, a purpose in mind sure but music in and of itself i mean certainly f for me how i would look at, at it points to something more than it reveals in and of itself and uh i i it's a kind of circular argument but uh, <laughs> uh i would say that that is in all likelihood its purpose is the activity for the sake of that uh, so you, you, do, so you it, don't necessarily go ahead. I cut you off. I apologize. Uh, you don't necessarily engage in it, n knowing that uh, that is another layer that I would say is you you can reach in terms of understanding why it exists in the first place, and 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 uh, and why we derive this feeling. You know, and it is just a feeling, isn't it? We it gives us a feeling of 
something greater than ourselves, some kind of meaning, but it's not something we, that's tangible that we can understand. It's just a feeling. Uh, however, uh, if that feeling exists to point us to a, a higher thing, <laughs> a higher purpose, and, you know, cards on the table, I'm, I'm essentially talking about God here, sure. um, uh, then, then it does have a purpose. It exists within the realms of our experience for a reason. So, so um, I'll be more careful, uh, and that's why I, I stopped my interruption, because I wanted to hear you more fully so I could be more careful. I, would you say that that disclosure of ontolog ontological depth is something extrinsic to the music or actually intrinsic to it? Uh, I think it, extrinsic, probably, um, but, I mean, it's it's almost... It almost doesn't matter. Uh, right. Right. That's the, I agree with that. It doesn't matter. And that means I don't think that's the purpose of music. I think you're disclosing a dimension or depth of music. And if that depth happens to be God, then God is the ultimate. God exists for no purpose whatsoever. Um, and th that's a classical doctrine of God. Right. And, and there is no purpose to participating in God at all. Uh I, I mean, I would beg, beg to differ, but... So uh, what's it for then? What's it for? So there's something more valuable than participating in God that participating in God is for? What's it for? Uh, well, I, you know, again, cards on the table, I, I'm coming from a Christian perspective, so it's it's quite a specific and you know, set answer to that. Um, and, and, you know, to the extent that we can understand it, but... Uh, if you follow the Christian tradition, then uh, the the ultimate meaning of uh, uh, life and creation is to be essentially reunited with God in a state of perfection. Uh, and, uh, you know, it, that is a, the kind of the closing of the loop of the imperfect, you know, mortal state that we are in now. Right. right. But again, I, 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 I love playing here. This is good. Uh, you're not you're just saying the point of, per, of participation is is deeper P participation that's what reconciliation is i mean this is classic doctrine and i'm not a christian but you know the point of participating in god is just to, to further participate in god right god doesn't need it at all I, you don't believe that do you uh i think that's just it's an interesting question um uh, god desires it so uh, you know, and we right, we but, can desire it. Uh, he desires it on our behalf, though, right? All right. So, so uh, I, I, we could get dog, dog, bogged down in, in uh, the scriptural interpretation. Let's not do that. But what I'm trying to say is, isn't it? Isn't it not? Isn't there? It's like it's a continuum of there's the depth of the meaning of music, and that's participating in what's more real. And you participate in what's more real for the sake of participating in what's more real. And I don't find it extrinsic, like what people typically mean by a purpose as a goal. More for, for me, a, a, like using the word purpose in a way that doesn't bleed in to the other things is to, to, to specify a goal state that is external to the activity you're engaging in, like getting the touchdown to win the game uh, or something like that. Um, and so I think that's uh, perhaps where, where we're in disagreement. I, 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 I feel that I, I do understand um, your point of view and, and probably would agree, but I think just that I would add uh, something you've already disavowed. You've already said um, the, you know, talking about the uh, uh, finding meaning in life as to, po to, to opposed to a meaning of life. Right, so right. I'm uh, essentially right. trying to reconcile yes, those yes, two things yes, rather yes. than just the one yes. thing that you are obviously in, engaged in for yourself um and and i i'm in my from my point of view my religion actually reconciles those things now I, I perhaps understand it in ways that other people might you know even who profess christianity yes. might yeah. not understand it yes. but still yes. for myself that there is reconciliation of both those things and uh that is where the meaning that we can find you know the meaning that we can find in life rather than the meaning of life uh, actually or originates from 
And I really liked what you were saying about um, the existential state of love. Yes. Uh, and if you conflate that with wisdom uh, and you conflate that with um, with meaning, uh, I'm entirely in agreement with you because that's <laughs> that's 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 the gospel. <laughs> you know, that's that's what yeah. Jesus said. Uh, and, you know, the Bible treats on on wisdom and foolishness uh, quite specifically. And, uh, um, you know, if you would infer if I can infer from your uh, argument that essentially, you know, the the opposite of of love the, the, and the things that you were describing, you know, the thing, the forces that are at play in us, the substitution of um uh uh you know want uh, of things for meaning uh, as opposed to love as meaning um you know no no wonder we're in such a state you know and it's an it seems to me to be an active uh, um uh tactic of those who who can and, and will and have the greater means now to exploit us to uh, uh ultimately to spend more money, to uh, to be yes. more isolated from each other, to lose the very connections in which we find meaning, to be more easily exploited, to give more money to those who can benefit from it. Um, yeah. Yes, we're in significant agreement. And mm. Paul, um, if you know anything about my work, I, I'm not here to challenge people's no quite uh, to the commitment, and, and nor do I want to put you in a position where you are having to defend. Christianity. Um, I don't want. I don't want to do that. I don't think that's right or respectful. I want to be in good fellowship with all the people that I'm entering into dialogue with. Yeah, and, and uh, there's. So I'll, 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 I won't agree with you, but I'll move towards you at least by saying this. I would say then the purpose of connectedness is to be, uh, to is to be more and more connected to what is more and more real, uh, and if, if, but for me, I understand that ultimately non teleological. So I'm not fully agreeing with you, but I am moving uh, a little bit towards your position to try and say that's how I would answer within the framework, given how I understand how you're using the word purpose. Well, I, I would you know, say the same thing back essentially, and I think we're, we are quite close without meeting. <laughs> <laughs> Which is fine. Uh, yeah, that's that's yeah, all fine. dialogos should do. Both people should feel that they've had insight and they've emerged into a wider and more encompassing vision that they could not get to on their own. That is what I most aspire to in acting and advocating for. Absolutely. I think we've got another question from, from Winnie. Yeah. Hi, Prof Hi, Professor. It's a pleasure to meet you. Can you hear me clearly? Yes, I can. Uh, so just in observing your passion and frustration sometimes, it, it, it's quite obvious that your work is very important to you. I wanted to ask you, um, why is your work so important to you that it warrants these emotions with you, um, considering the endless nature of this work as well? Mm. Yeah, yeah. Excellent question. Um, a humbling question, and I mean that pro uh, properly. Um, I, I won't, I'm not going to go through my autobiography or anything. It's out there in public if people want to see it. Uh, but um, I've experienced, I've experienced a profound meaning crisis in my own life in my past, and I've seen it in other people. And I, when I started to address it personally, and then try to understand that scientifically and share that with my students, their eyes would light up. That's what caught fire more than anything else I was teaching. And I realized uh, that for me, the way that connectedness is means that any attempt to alleviate it for myself is inherently bound up with alleviating it for others. And that then intersected with my vocation. It is not just my occupation, my vocation as a teacher. I, I strive, I aspire to emulate Socrates as a teacher, a transformative teacher. And so that sense of vocation and teaching and that sense of connectedness, deep and profound with the shared amelioration and alleviation of the meaning crisis um, and the fact that 
there's, I think, good evidence that it's getting worse rather than better. And one more thing, I think our inability to address the meta crisis, the what Bjorkman and others call this intersecting, accelerating interconnection of the environmental crisis, economic disparity, the looming energy crisis, it's still there, by the way, we're just pretending it's not, uh, political crisis, political polarization. I was in Prague. Prague, in the 90s, became independent of communism and became a democracy. They're now worried about the, the, the demise of their democracy and the advent of the meaning crisis in Czechoslovakia. That's why they, uh, Czech Republic, that's why they invited me there. So, like, the fact that the meaning crisis is hamstringing us it's sucking up our ability to deal with complex problems like the meta crisis that require deep individual and collective transformation for their solution. So wanting to save the world for my kids, my vocation as a teacher and my deep sense of the connectedness of any personal uh, alleviation of the meaning crisis and the alleviation of the meaning crisis of other people, all of those are deeply interwoven for me. Did that answer your question? Yes, thank you for sharing. Um, and following on that, what advice would you give to people who aspire to do work similar to you? Take up an ecology of practices um, within a community that is respectful of current cognitive science. And there are more and more of these. And that is dedicated to enhancing, curating, transforming individual intelligence and collective intelligence into individual wisdom within collective wisdom. That's what needs to be done. Thank you. Just oh, do you I, a question? Okay, go, go, go. okay, yeah. Sorry, I don't mean to backtrack, but I just wanted to ask a question about what you were talking about with Paul earlier. Um, yeah. about purpose and connectedness and you were saying something fascinating about that Paul was simply just being more and more engaged and connected in this sort of belief that God had the purpose that he was keeping getting more and more involved in that but is is there a point where if Paul genuinely believed that that was the purpose would that change the dynamic or would that become sort of delusional and is there a sort of point where faith is important beyond the purpose that you're talking about necessity isn't drinking that has a clear direct implication to your life you'll die if you don't but the at the very high end of the abstraction that if you didn't have faith potentially there is no purpose well let me answer that uh, 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 carefully um, and I do this within the series and I also do it ongoing basis. Um, first, I want to get clear about what faith means. We have come to understand it sort of post-Luther as the individual assent of propositions without proper evidence, which is not what faith has meant, even within the Christian tradition historically. I'm not a Christian, but I have studied it very deeply. And if you even go back into uh, Jewish da'ath, Right, faith meant something. Something. The metaphors are sexual intercourse metaphors, not assertion of proposition metaphors. Belief comes from the German beleben to give your heart to something. It is not to assert a proposition. It is to feel a profound connectedness. So the way I'm faithful to my partner is not by asserting propositions without evidence about her. It's that I have bound how my identity unfolds to how hers unfolds and allowed her to do the same with me. I transcend myself through her. She transcends herself through me. And we do this in a fashion that is reciprocally opening us into the depths of ourselves, the depths of each other, and the depths of what it is to be a human being. That is what I understand by faith. Now, if that's what you mean by faith, faith is the reciprocal opening, the flow, the existential flow of connectedness, and therefore is inseparable from it. Um, now, if you ask what the faith is for, the answer in many traditions is, well, I'll use Jesus of Nazareth, it's to have the abundant life. It's not, it, like, 
Like it's when what's the abundant life? It's this connectedness. It's it's for itself. Uh, because if you make it for any like the one of the big problems we have is we have fallen into purely instrumental reason. That all that reason is just for something else, something beyond itself. But that means it has no inherent value. You know, we turn everything into having an instrumental value, and then we're looking around. What are all the instruments for? And then you you either have to say, well, there's something that has an inherent value and has no instrumental value, or you're bereft for any justification of anything you do. I'm just trying to get you to accept, I suppose, that those inherent values aren't deeply displaced. They're right in the very guts of your cognition and your consciousness. They can take you to great heights and great depths, but they're not alien from you. They are integral to your very cognitive agency. That's what I'm trying to argue. And is, faith is, is, is inhabiting that, to my mind. Just on that point, I love what you're saying about having art for art's sake. Um, so it reminded me of um, a passage in James Joyce's portrait of the artist as a young man, when he talks about um, uh, improper art being sort of didactic and pointing you towards something else that's not it, that's not art. But proper art is something that he calls aesthetic arrest. So um, when you're when you're taken by something like a beautiful piece of music that just exists and, and you're connecting with it for, for its own sake, just on this point, what do you think um, our role as artists and musicians is in solving the meaning crisis? I think that what art can do is you see, I happen to think that the three transcendentals are actually interpenetrating. I think that we only pursue the true because we regard it as a good. And we are only attracted to it because it's in some way beautiful. And we don't like the beautiful that isn't ultimately true or good, and et cetera, et cetera. I won't go into this argument. There's great arguments given by D.C. Schindler, Clark, and others around this. Um, and I think art can, therefore remind us of the beautiful as the disclosure of what's most real, that's the true, in a way that enhances our ability to connect with what's most real, and that's the good, that's the wise. And so the job of art is to sati, to awaken people right where they are in the guts of their cognition and their consciousness and their communitas, how they're bound to other people and their character, awaken them, to a deepening connection, a love for what is real. There's no propositional answer to the meaning crisis. The answer is to get people to the place where they can, in an intellectually respectable manner, fall in love with the depths of being again. That's what Spinoza, the most rational and logical of the philosophers, the great philosopher argued. The, the goal was the intellectual. It doesn't mean what we mean but today by intellectual. It's the intellectual love of God. You fall in love with, right, you ratio religio, you rationally fall in love with what is most real. And that's what the art can do. And the point is, again, that you can't get, it's like you can't proposition your way into being someone's friend. Well, I've deduced, for, like, try online dating. It doesn't work. <laughs> look, 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 on paper, we should be great. And we're not. <laughs> that happens reliably in online dating, right? Because it's not ultimately a propositional thing. It's a perspectival thing and, and a participatory thing. Art awakens the perspectival and the participatory to their potential for taking us through beauty, properly construed, into the depths of the world and the depths of ourselves in a mutually resonant manner. That's art's capacity. It ultimately should play the central role in helping people awakening from the meaning crisis. Mm -hmm. Yeah, more questions? Yeah. Hi, John, this has been a treat. Thanks so much for, <coughs> for all of your great answers. Um, I feel like love has been a sort of theme that's run through everything tonight. Mm -hmm. because, you know, I was telling when you came to the example of um, the academics who were interviewed about saving for their pension that you had to invoke a love connectedness 
situation for them to actually begin to care about that anymore. Um, so I don't know whether you think that, because um, you mentioned like falling in love with the depths of being is your what one's goal should be or what your goal is, I guess. And I guess that's a, that's a, a, a solution to the meaning crisis in a way. So is, is is the project really is um, kind of rehabilitating love as something which is no longer saccharine and uh, yeah 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 I think uh, yeah it's to rescue love from the detritus of the of the romantic revolution the fact that we call it romantic love means the romantic re the romantics really insinuated their philosophy into our understanding and experience of love I think one of the great evils of modern society is the romantic comedy. I think it is a pernicious and evil art form that um, is so prevalent and, and while well, being so full of bullshit that it tells us that such a rehabilitation of love, but, but to my mind, and I've tried to argue that rehabilitating love is also to rehabilitate what we mean by wisdom. It's also to rehabilitate what we mean by meaning. I think like loving wisely and meaningfully um, is exactly what it is to awaken from the meaning crisis. But yes, a rehabilitation if, in love about a rehabilitation of love in that way is, is 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 at the core. Like I said, but for me, and this is what I think, you know, Plato's at his best when he's talking about love and wisdom. Um, I, I think many people would agree with that too. But that's what I think. And so, like I say, that 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 interweaving of love, wisdom, and religio that Plato does so deftly, and being able to rehabilitate that without having to buy into an ancient, you know, um, worldview, but figuring how to resituate that within the kind of ontology that is available, as, available to us now with the irremovable presence and power of science, that's the project that we face. You said saccharin, which is exactly the issue. How do we bring back loving wisely and with deep religio in a way that it doesn't sound saccharin because we're either buying into the romantic or the decadent romantic degradation of that, or we're just capitulating to its reductive alternative. It's nothing but chemicals in your brain. That's the problem that we're facing. I just say, um, it sounds like love actually is something you watch every Christmas time. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, but is that, does that mean that love then, it's like the opposite of addiction, right? It, exactly. That's exactly what love is. I, no, no, I, I mean this seriously. So, so Mark Lewis, friend of mine, colleague, right? Uh, foremost you know, neuroscientist on addiction. And he was also uh, himself a former addictor, right? Um, so he knows it inside and out, literally. Um, and he basically argues that the disease model that we've had, that what you have is like a disease that you're trying to cure, doesn't, do, like you're infected, doesn't account for the data. Uh, like, 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 just here's one piece of data. You, you have, oh, you know, opiates are so addictive. Well, you have soldiers in Nam using heroin and they come back to the united states and 90 percent of them just stop using without any problem that's one piece of a whole i you know i, I went to a whole conference about all this empirical evidence that the disease model doesn't work what you have instead is an agent arena relationship i've been talking about that throughout today when you're a soldier in nam that's very different than being a citizen in the united states when you take people out of a particular agent arena relationship, you can snap them free from addiction. That's why the psychedelics, you get people that are, they have addictions that are resistant to treatment and you get them to have a mystical experience or even a, a powerful psychedelic experience. And one of those can snap them completely out of the addiction. Well, how is that working with this deep, you know, chemical disease? I'm not saying biochemistry isn't involved. I'm, I'm, He's arguing against that being the necessary and sufficient factor. He talks about this process he calls reciprocal narrowing. It goes something like this. So I'm in a very stressful environment and I drink some alcohol to remove the stress. But what it also does is it reduces my cognitive agency. 
which means my environment, I can solve fewer problems in my environment. So my environment becomes more threatening. So now it's more stressful. So I need to drink more. But as I drink more, I degrade my agency. So now my environment gets more and more threatening and more and more pressing. So I drink more. My cognitive agency and the environment, they're reciprocally narrowing until I get to a place where the environment has no future for me, no possibilities, and I can't be any other than I am, and I am completely compelled in my behavior. That's addiction. It's reciprocal narrowing. I was literally at lunch with Mark, and I said, but Mark, if reciprocal narrowing is possible, isn't reciprocal opening possible? And he went, of course. Oh, my God. You know what reciprocal opening is? Love. That's how you get people to fall in love. Not just romantic love. Friendship love. Fellowship love. Familial love. Reciprocal opening. Two people. Bring them together. I disclose something of myself. And if you reciprocate by disclosing something about yourself, and then I reciprocate, and we get to see more and more, and we reciprocally open, it's called Mutually Accelerating Disclosure, the work by Aaron. That's the last name of the researcher. That's what love is. Love is the opposite, literally the opposite of addiction. Mm. That's magical. Thanks. Mm. Thanks. Thanks. What you were saying there echoes a lot of what we were talking about in our discussion with um, Michael Subaru, who also was a guest on this. He was talking about the parable of the Good Samaritan. Um, yeah. The Samaritan as someone who's ritually unclean, who's sort of um, intermarried yeah. with um, other cultures that weren't like the Jewish cultures that they were um, segregated from. Um, and so he, he says that this, uh, this idea of um, universal morality or, or, or love is this idea of um, like a bullseye, concentric rings. Um, yes. and Jesus and the, the Buddha were thoughtful to extend these rings to people on the other side of the world who will never know, you know, this kind of thing. Yeah, yes. Yeah, I don't really have a question attached to that, but I just, I just thought that echoes a lot of what we were talking about. <laughs> yeah. And that, that goes back to the argument I was making. Um, about the deep interweaving of morality and religio. Mm. Religio, the, the, the enhancement of connectedness, is precisely that which affords the extension of your moral regard. Mm. Yeah. Do we have time for Stephen's question? Oh, thoughts? yeah, just, sorry, we, we, we've got a, another question just from someone who, who couldn't be here, and it's, it's it's on a notion that I don't think we've talked about very much, but it's to do with um, exaptation. Uh, oh, yes. Yeah. yeah, so um, he says, what are the conditions for exaptation to arise? You've said that colleagues noticed and commented on your cognitive capacity to be more balanced and flow more easily after you began practicing Tai Chi. Yes, yes. Is it, is it a given that newly acquired skills in one domain are transferred into other domains uh, of, of being? In this no. example, okay, in, <laughs> in this <laughs> example of movement into cognitive, uh, I have an intimation that it has to do with a sort of somatic felt sense. I'd love to hear what, more about what you have to say about this idea. So, that question of how to drive exaptation is the central one of the central questions I'm wrestling with right now. So I am now going to give an answer that is very much a work in progress kind of answer. Um, so if 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 you don't want to hear that, I won't do it. But if you're open to extending the, me, me charity around that, then I'm happy to do it. So which would you prefer? Answer. Yes. Yeah, <laughs> sounds like flow. <laughs> So it is not the case that learning a skill in one domain simply transfers to another. In fact, uh, that often will fail to happen. Skills can inappropriately transfer and interfere with each other. Um, so getting what's called transfer appropriate processing is really, really central. Um, and so I've been asking myself, why is it that flow when I'm doing Tai Chi did transfer to many domains and percolate out so other people were noticing what was happening in my Tai Chi Chuan in how I was carrying out my philosophical discussion or my scientific practice that, that they were seeing that kind of transfer. Why did that transfer? And why do why does the flow state within video games often fail to transfer to people so much so that they get addicted to the video game? I'm not saying this is for all people or for all video games, but the WHO does recognize video game addiction as a thing. People can get trapped into a flow state that is only realizable for them in the in the in the video game and they more and more get depressed anti-flow in their life 
And those two then reinforce each other and they get locked into the video game, right? And so the question is, how do you get something like flow in one state to transfer broadly to others? Now, this to me is, and this is where you get these weird convergences that are such a great pleasure for a cognitive scientist. I have been investigating. So remember the, that imaginal, where the people were using imagination in order to properly aspire. That's not just imagination. That's what's called the imaginal. It's imagination for the sake of perception, of creating real connectedness. You have to do this, for example, when you're doing Tai Chi Chuan. When I'm teaching people to, to do Tai Chi Chuan, I, I tell them to imagine they're standing in a river and knees to feet are sinking into the mud. And from knees to around your belly button, this is like the flowing water. And from belly button up, this is like, right, um, being in the air. You want it just to feel as airy as, right, as, as possible. You want the flowing in the, uh, the, and then the sinking. And when people are imagining that, they're not engaging in a picture in their mind. It's, it's more like when an actor takes up a prop and, some, and, and is enacting a particular role. Because what, what that does is that it actually enhances their ability to pick up on very otherwise neglected subtle patterns, sensory motor patterns of balance, uh, motor control coordination, uh, awareness, and it puts them into the place where they can then properly do the form. So that's the, that's the imaginal. That's exactly what was going on in the experiment. People had to be properly bound to their future self. You have to be properly bound to your future self if you want to become more wise, more rational, etc. So give me that notion of the imaginal. And for those of you who want to see this more, you can see the talk I gave at my invited lecture on Cambridge, at Cambridge, um, on 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 rationality and ritual, because ritual is the use of imaginal, the imaginal, in order to try and get something that is done within this limited context that's been set up as a safety frame for serious play in such a way, and this is what the people who are doing work on ritual knowledge like Jennings and Williams and Brian and Schellingbreck, right? What you're trying to do is get it set up in the right way that it will transfer as broadly and as deeply into your life and percolate as broadly and deeply into your cognition as possible. And, and so people are going back, and I know this sounds like a very odd thing to all of our ears, and they're looking at what, like, like, like when you have the, this, when you have ritual contexts in which people are doing this and the degree to which it transfers. Now, before you say this is silly superstition, my RA has done some very good work looking at people engaged in personal projects of trying to cultivate wisdom. And what he found was that people who are doing this within a religious framework do much better than people who are doing it within a secular framework. Now, before you cheer for your particular religion, you should know that there's no significant difference between the different religions on this. They all do equally well, but they all do better than the secular, precisely because they have this ritual aspect to it. And, and we, of course, we're, we're post-Freud and we're post-Marx, so we hear ritual in this totally negative sense. But I put it to you, when you're playing music and it's really deep, that's ritual in exactly the way I'm talking about. You're doing something that is playing with your salience landscaping. It's not imaginary. You're probably not picturing anything. You might be, but it's not necessary. But it's imaginal, right? It's getting you into a play. It's getting you to imagine in the imaginal sense a, a comportment, an orientation, a salience landscaping, a relevance realization stance towards reality that can transfer out and percolate into, right, through all the layers of your psyche into your body and connect those and inform and transform your life. And so the answer to the question, I think, has to do with the proper, this is a work in progress, a proper re-appreciation in both senses of the word understanding, coming to understand, like taking a music appreciation class, a re-appreciation and a revaluation, right, of ritual and to see how pervasive it is in our life implicitly and places where we do seriously play. And how can we, this goes back to the issue of art. I think we call something art when it engages us, not as consumers, which, for, which is most of our relationship to art, which means it's not art. Oh, that, oh, that's another conversation, right? Art is that which calls us into ritual the way I'm describing it, and therefore is those 
rituals that do transfer broadly, percolate deeply, and thereby evolve our fittedness to our world, enhance meaning in life. That's where I think the answer is to be found. So part of this is therefore a deep re-understanding and reappreciation of the relationships between art, ritual, serious play, and the imaginal. Mm, I think that would be a brilliant place to, to end. Thank you so much for your time and your generosity. <laughs> Well, well, th thank you uh, so much. That, that This was fantastic. I would very much like to have uh, this uh, file, if possible, to put on my channel. Yeah. Uh, after, after you put it on yours, of course, we can coordinate. I don't want to step on anybody's toes. Uh, but I, I found this genuinely dialogical. And as, as you can tell, I was really drawn into it. It, 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 was, it, it was adductive. It, adduces, it adduced so much from me. I felt very, it felt very Socratic to me. Uh, you were you were very much a, a, you were very much Socrates for me. The questions you were asking and the provocations. So I, I really appreciated it. Well, thank you. Uh, I was just going to say, like, uh, I hope we engaged in what you call dialogue. But yeah, that's, <laughs> yeah, it's a bit of synchronicity. But um, yeah, no, thank you so much, and I'll definitely send the file across to you um, as soon as it's come to me. So yeah, thank you. see Jonathan Pajot. Oh yeah, of course. By the way, um, we've we've also invited um, Jonathan Pajot to give us a, a Q and A on Monday, seventh of October uh, of um, November. So it'll be really interesting to talk to him about. Oh wow. Uh, oh, well, that's wonderful. That's wonderful. Uh, that'd be great. Um, and maybe at some point in the future, you can have both of us together then, because we oh, we oh. really we, we really spark off of each other in yeah. really interesting ways, and, uh, uh, and 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 we both appreciate that. But uh, you'll have an amazing time with him. You, uh, and many of you know, I think I hold him in very high regard. I think he uh, the what he, the uh, like I don't know how he did it. He somehow went into a room or something and he came out a fifth century church father uh, who's saying profound provocative things about symbolism and 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 the neoplatonic way of life which i think are really really important you'll you, you'll you'll just you'll you'll love it his thinking is delicious his thinking is delicious <laughs> well, we'll look forward to that and um next week as well we're, we're having um carl brook who's the author of the road to lucis so he, he'll be an expert to talk to us um about um psychedelics and what you were talking about like um oh opening. wow yeah uh, so lots to come but yeah i'll send you the i'll send you the videos <laughs> thank you very much everyone thank you, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.